Uh, and I've been um, uh, a practitioner for a number of years. Last five years, I've really been helping clients do digital transformations. So how do you make uh, enterprises operate at the speed of startups? And that's where I spend most of my time today. My name is Jane Jinzo. Um, I am an old school, hardcore data center infrastructure architect. Um, but today, um, in my new world, I am the product owner of MDL Cloud, um, which is a completely cloud native DevOps enabled environment. Um, so, um, so who we are? So, um, so essentially, I uh, lead a team of uh, two thousand practitioners. What we do each day um, is we about we have about two or three hundred teams deployed at different clients, and in many of the situations, we need to build solutions for our clients. And so, we have teams that are data engineers, agile people, programmers. Um, who have to take an idea and bring it to life, typically within two or three weeks. Sometimes we um, spend three or four months. But really what we want to do is um, help uh, enterprises like banks, uh, like retail companies, um, design new experiences for their users and then bring them to life and help them launch it in, in weeks rather than years. So that's kind of what we do. And we're going to talk about the infrastructure that we've set up um, to support that vision. So um, Jane had mentioned uh, MDL Cloud. MDL Cloud is our internal platform that we use to build our enterprise-grade solutions. Um, but we didn't have MDL Cloud from the end of 2015 and, and, and into 2016. Instead, what we had was an environment that took weeks to provision even servers. Um, we had to go through compliance and security reviews. We had to um, support teams that were all over the world. So our teams don't all sit in one location, they sit everywhere, so we had to get them um, operating in a remote uh, scenarios. Um, and we had no kind of single developer experience or laptop setup. And so all of these things are contributing to uh, paying for a developer. And if you remember, we have to have around 200 teams kind of actively working on apps, and every day and every hour matters for us. So we had to change this, this over, uh, change this um, experience. And so what we did is we basically said, what would be an ideal environment for our developers and our platform? And so. We said that um, we wanted a very simple laptop experience for developers. And why is that important for us? Most of our developers are in remote locations, either airplanes, client sites, down the line. And so they, they need to be able to code when there's no connectivity. So there's one need. The second need was um, we didn't want a big kind of uh, heavy ticket-based system where we create a ticket for someone else to go do something. We needed a fully end-to-end -end automated solution. Uh, third is we wanted to get an app idea up and running in five minutes in a production-like environment, right? from idea to production in, in five minutes. And finally, we wanted um, something that wasn't too expensive but did all the other three things. So that was our aspiration at the end of 2016. And so the journey we took was um, we used design-based thinking first. So the asset we have is developers. We have hundreds of developers. And we basically um, documented all the things that developers want to do. So they would join a project. They create a GitHub project or they join an existing project. They want to be able to produce code. They want to be able to deploy code to different environments. They want to be able to uh, make changes. We want to be able to, to uh, test the application, uh, security test it, scale it, um, we want to freeze it and, and take it offline. So we, we documented all these developer journeys and then we said what's the ideal way to, ser to serve every one of those journeys. Next what we did is said look, we, we want a ticketless system. We don't want any, any tickets in our environment. And so we basically said we're going to go with immutable um, infrastructure. And so we, we, that was the second design decision. 
The third one is that um, we knew that we weren't able to provide everything that developers would want. And so we had to make it easy for our developers to use services that were outside the platform. So we had to make it extensible. And then finally, um, we wanted um, our developers to basically operate this themselves. So see what was working, what wasn't working, debug things, uh, and move things from environment, environment to environment without learning 20 different tools. So we created a single pane, a glass of paint. And we wanted everything to be automated and self-service. So they would have to take, our developers would not have to talk to anybody to get anything done themselves. So our answer to this was um, MDL Cloud, which is basically essentially cloud native. Um, it's a mutable code, um, and we can kind of blow, the cla blow our platform away and bring it back up again in a few hours, as many times as we like. Uh, we make our de developers do continuous integration, but we provide the continuous delivery for them. Um, everything is swappable, uh, everything is based on Docker. And then finally, uh, we let the developers choose what tools they want. And then maybe, Jane, you can. The first lesson that we learned was moving into the cloud from an enterprise data center, we had to be cloud native in our ecosystem. Using AWS for our infrastructure, uh, we looked down to the tools and the operating systems that we had in play, and we wanted to make sure that we were taking what was optimized in the cloud, and we weren't taking on management responsibility that we didn't need. So for us, that really meant partnering with CoreOS, who gave us a stripped down, secured, Linux operating system with built-in patch management, and also looking to the cloud uh, for our identity management. We don't need to manage mutable things. We can outsource those to native cloud providers and do it much cheaply and more effectively. In the early days of MDL Cloud, we tried a pure AWS native play, but this was over two and a half years ago, and eventual consistency in those tools meant that there were lots of gaps in the environment. At that point in time, we partnered, we found the HashiCorp environment and as you can see we've got quite a bit of their stack in our environment and it's been an excellent journey. <laughs> a really big so what in this screen is Vault. If you're playing out in the cloud, developing for the cloud, secret management is one of the most important things that you can do. Vault for us allows us to provide ephemeral credentials that we cycle every 15 minutes. We also, you'll see later in our demonstration, our ability that we've actually given to our developers to integrate and use Vault, so they no longer have to get that pen test finding of incorrect uh, credentials management. Continuous integration and delivery. Um, as we said, you know, in a traditional DevOps environment, you know, our artifact library is where the line is drawn. In MDL Cloud, we start well before that. Um, that's where the DevX experience kind of begins. Again, we've got a very heavy play here um, from Nomad um, and console from HashiStack. Obviously, Nomad helps us orchestrate all of our workloads within our environment seamlessly with scale, and console allows us to do all of our service detection and health checks. It also enables our developers to be able to write custom health checks within their environment to further escalate their self-healing capabilities within their environment. In MDL Cloud, we have one principle. If it's outside the container, we look after it for you. If it's inside the container, it's the developer's responsibility. But we do enable you with the tools to enable quick, resilient environments. Patrick's included, but swappable. You know, everything we've got is Dockerized. Uh, when we're offering an extensible AWS service, it is vanilla, we don't train it up. Obviously, at the end of a lot of our engagements, we're transitioning our applications and our codes off to our clients, and they're taking it back to their environments. They need the ability to quickly swap in and out of identity um, messaging providers and the likes. Um, so we make sure that we can follow the Docker principle of insert, swap out. And as Sadi spoke to earlier, we spent a lot of time talking to our developers about the types of tooling that they use and they want to work in. One thing that became really evident to us early on was the amount of console fatigue that developers were starting to gain. The more we pushed to the cloud, the more native cloud tools that were coming into play, what we realized was the responsibility was being pushed down onto our developers, that in reality, what they should be doing is writing great code and not fussing around. So we focused on some really, really core tools that they like to spend most of their time in, that they could do their work in, and brought it into our infrastructure as part of our living ecosystem. 
Great lessons. Um, hard lessons along the way. Yes, there have been many. <laughs> um, in the initial iterations of MDL Cloud from infrastructure through to delivery pipelines, we would build and blow away MDL Cloud on a daily basis. It was good for the soul and gave us a lot of practice. The key, big key takeaway for us is continuous delivery for infrastructure. Um, it's harder to do than it sounds, but the value if you get it right is phenomenal. Competency for cloud development. It's really challenging to find, even today, um, people with a broad range of skills to span all of these tool sets. Um, shared responsibility. Easy to say, really hard to put into practicality. Um, so we had to stop and think about how we could embed some of those concepts in our pipeline so developers and DevOps engineers didn't have to figure out whose responsibility it was. Vendor evolution. Be it the products that are out in the native cloud, or be it um, have quickly vendors moved and bought and are consumed, um, it really can be quite taxing on our developers. So the big three key takeaways for us was cloud native, AWS integrated. It didn't have to be a native AWS play for it to be viable in our environment. Simplify the cloud. Focus our teams on Docker. Abstract away where we see complexities in the tools that they're using and let them focus on development. And last but not least, when shared responsibility and vendor evolution, abstract the vendors out of the equation and embed cyber in the core of your environment. So how does this actually play out in the MDL world? Well, here are our building blocks. MDL, and you'll see all of these um, in a few minutes and a demonstration. MDL Cloud Utility is a 100% offline development environment that allows teams to build up and run MDL Cloud locally on their laptops. You can be in an aeroplane, you can be in a mine shaft, you can be on an oil rig out in the middle of the ocean. You can still build and iterate very quickly um, and know with confidence when it comes time to promote to the cloud, your code's going to work. MDL Deployer. This is our single pane of glass environment. This is where we do all of our integrated tooling. So no matter what product we've selected to do what piece or function within the cloud, our developers don't need to know about it. They've probably heard the product's name but they're going to see it as a widget or a line in YAML. Um, MDL Deploy Agent. This is the heavy lifting tool that we wrote in the back end. It allows us to put all the controls down in the core, provisions all of our services and ensures everything meets um, our expectations with regards to cybersecurity. Again, our developers don't have to waste time thinking about core controls. We do it for them. And what that all leads down to is 100% self-service from inception through to production delivery. It is the digital unicorn that they were talking about earlier in the panel. We do not have tickets from local through to production. Probably worth noting here, uh, for anyone that's had to do an enterprise uh, data center migration to the cloud or is wondering how DevOps play, um, at end year last year, we wholesale lift and shifted over 150 applications from an enterprise data center, transformed to cloud native and promoted them through production in a six week window. Um, so the value and the velocity that delivers to the organization is quite significant. So we're gonna go through right now is we're gonna give you an introduction um, into working software wings. As we said, um, tooling of choice for our developers. They spend lots of time in Slack and lots of time in Git, so it only made sense for us to bridge those two worlds together. Our developers can create a project in the MDL Cloud Pipeline simply from uh, ChatOps Git command, um, create project. It'll create the Git repos in the back end um, and provision them with default artifacts that they need to kick off their pipeline. From there, our developers clone down their repos and will come in and actually define in the deploy.yml what they need to do. Again, we simplified the language. Um, Back-end service is private, front-end service is public. Um, if it's public service, obviously it's probably going to need a back-end to talk to, so we specify that in our deploy.yaml of our front-end. Um, this allows us to create uh, Fabio zero-touch proxies uh, for the two services to talk interactively together uh, deployed out in the cloud. Notice right here, our teams don't need to know about any of our siders, what's a public or a private network. They don't need to know how to configure a proxy within our environment. All they need to know is it public, is it private, and what needs to talk to what.
From here we're going to go and look at our Docker Compose, make sure we've got our container there and ready. And now what we're going to go and do is we're actually going to go and pull down MDL Cloud Offline Utility. <coughs> From here you'll see obviously a nice little readme file and we're going to bring MDL Cloud up locally on this user's machine. Prerequisite for this is you have to have Docker installed and you have to have access to MDL Cloud. From there what we actually bought online were our key components to MDL Cloud. We bought up Vault, we bought up Console, we bought up Nomad, we bought up Postgres. Uh, so what you'll see here going on here. We're also going to bring up Fabio because we need the two services to be able to talk to one another. And then the next thing that we're going to want to do is we're actually going to want to bring our front and back end applications online. So I've got MDL Cloud up locally. I've exposed my routing tables. You'll see my two new services, my front end and my back end application. Simple API call. You'll see that I've created, created two Fabio routes in there. And you'll see that my services are up online. This has all been done 100% offline. From here, obviously, the next step, we get the phone call from our developer, he, from his PO, that he wants to go and promote to the cloud environment. Again, why would we need to change consoles? So what we allow the teams to do here is they can do a git commit and push, and we'll actually trigger a distribution up into the cloud and launch that alpha pipeline. We obviously run through our Circle CI integration tests. You'll see a success play on here. And it'll actually take you into Deployer, which is our single plane of class environment. So you'll see here is Deployer. This is the pipeline for our front end application. What you'll see here is in the top is a continuous deployment pipeline and we've got our service management down the bottom. Again, I just got the phone call from my PO on the way home. They want to promote to beta because they got a pen testing. All I've got on me is my mobile phone and my Slack. So a developer can go in there and he can actually stage a promotion from alpha through beta and bring it online. The little square in the bottom that you see turning from red to green is actually their container. The amount of squares that you have is the total amount of container accounts. Just to show, if you have a look at the URLs in the top left hand corner, what you'll see there is alpha.mdl.cloud, which is actually live in our cloud environment. You'll see that we've also provisioned without request an AWS S3 bucket for our user and provided them um, the URL by default. We'll come in, we'll also do the same exact provisioning for our back end service. We're going to do a redeploy. Again, just to show you the difference, it doesn't matter where you do it git command, Slack, or directly through the deployer UI. We give our users the flexibility to work in the tooling that they choose. One thing that we did discover through our journey is database migrations are really difficult. And in most organizations, some things still require discussions with DBAs. Well, we didn't like that option and we didn't want to give out DBL access. So we actually just developed a process called database migrations that allows us to perform for a very short period of time a privileged execution for rebuilding of a schema. Um, teams just merely provide the artifact as part of their Git repo. Now once we've deployed within the environment, Obviously, teams need the ability to go and check certain information about the health of their environment. We, by de default, include a number of health checks which teams can then build on. But again, working on the principle, don't make developers do things that don't matter. Um, we need to scale our environment. That 20-person pilot, by the way, is 3,000. So we've just scaled our container, container count within the environment from one container to 20 containers and went from 128 megs of memory to 512. Nomad will go out and create all of the jobs within the environment and scale across the workers, while Consult does the service detection for us. At this stage, there's still been no conversation with anyone other than the developer knowing what they needed to do. In the background, you'll probably find, depending on how many developers are actively scaling and auto scale groups probably configured, this is an activity that happens within our environment all the time. Um, a request will come in from a client 
project will need to be executed <coughs> in a very short period of time, so team full scale from one server to 100 containers automatically in order to hit the timelines that they need to provision. As we talked about earlier, we don't necessarily want our teams thinking about things that don't matter. So when it comes to all of the default logging you heard about in the last session for security, we include that by default. It's one of the guardrails. Teams don't need to think about what they need to log generically within the environment about their application. We do it for them by default. We also don't want them having to think about what kind of queries they need to ride, run within the logging environment. We pre can all of that for them and include it in log links as part of their pane of glass. Secrets, as we talked about earlier, are really super important in the cloud. We've actually exposed to our development communities the ability to use Vault uh, directly from within the single pane of glass. Again, they can also specify their credentials in deploy.yaml. Um, this gives the ability for them to no longer have to worry about any pen, pen test findings coming down about mismanagement of credential use. Our teams can hibernate their services, reducing their resource consumption at AWS to zero. And within three minutes, restore their services back to production. Very handy <coughs> for teams where they're in a steady state in production and they're not actively using their pre-production environments. <coughs> As you'll see, the 20 containers come back online. Our change management principle is very, very simple. We believe in letting teams do what they need to do based on what their governance is. We do have sanity checks where we just ask them to provide some information that allows us to uniquely link the user to the task that they're completing. <coughs> Holding deployments is another really important thing. Um, anyone that's working with external pen testing companies, you need to be able to hold deployments so code changes aren't going through while pen testing is occurring. Our teams can effectively freeze their pipeline um, during those times with hold. Also, in our pre-production environments, we give our teams the ability to drop their databases should something have gone horribly wrong, and simply restarting that stage will allow them to rerun all of their database migration scripts. in our demo here is realistically we'll go through and we'll actually promote the rest of the code through to production um, and scale it out. Uh, so you get that horrible phone call in production. <laughs> Performance is going to a halt. We've had organic uptake and we've got 100 times the amount of users that we thought um, we do again in production and seamlessly provide our users the ability to scale out their environment. We have faith in our infrastructure um, and our auto scaling groups to allow us to go through um, and cope with whatever changes they push through into the environment. We do have one sanity check here. Uh, this is around a compliancy order, data classifications, pen testing. Um, in R2, this will actually be um, replaced with automated checks into our ISOC registry. And so in under 11 minutes, we went from local to alpha, to beta, to production. And again, you can verify based on the URLs in the top, top left hand corner. As an infrastructure person, this one, this is the one I love the most in production, being able to give developers the ability to scale from one to 15 and not have to sweat about it. We ensure that every resource that's provisioned by default meets McKinsey and Company's security standards. So we go to the highest um, which requires BYOK at rest encryption for any persistent data. Um, it ensures that any S3 bucket that's deployed on private ACL and is again encrypted with BYOK encryption. Um, if we look at it from an inspection cyber standpoint specifically, we do deep container inspection, auto remediation. There's also a maintenance mode that you can't see there uh, where we can auto close and politely put up a nice screen um, should it pass a check. Um, in the actual code deployment pipeline, we do use quality code check in there as well, so we try and prevent things from getting into the wild. When we pivot through to next, what we're delivering this year, it will be fully integrated, fully self-audited um, setups embedded at the core as well.
for example, I have tons of requests. Uh, I have tons of requests, and there is an incident. There is this and that. And how can you manage uh, that uh, to make less tick happen? It's a journey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to know how. This is about again a shared responsibility model. Um, so our SRE models, where we automatically address what we see coming through in the environment. I would say we're at phase 2.5 of that, um, where our API gateways and our auto remediation are going back into play. Um, we took away traditional tools for ticketing. So if people want to chat with their SREs, they've got to come to Slack. And from there we manage it. And we actually require the community to foster support. So nine times out of 10, in context to that environment, somebody else within our community will probably answer a question a user has prior to. Um, we also produce a lot of content. So we have a very open community forum. Um, we have a 101 developers guide. We've got interactive tutorials that take team members through explaining concepts. Um, we spend a lot of time talking developers about what's the right thing for them to know, um, instead of expecting them to just go and figure out what all of these products are doing. But it is a journey at day one. People are going to be asking a lot of questions. And you do have to be prepared not to come at it from a ticketing standpoint, but come at it from an educational capability building standpoint.